Hello everyone, welcome to Crime and Justice. You know what, I'm sitting here and I was listening to that music and then I suddenly realised, well, I know part of what I'm looking at tonight, right, I know one part of it, but I can't, cannot remember what else I was going to be showing tonight, I can't remember, right? And I'm sure I've got my downloads. 
but I can't remember what it was. My brain is like dying on me. Right. Um. Yeah, it's not that one. It's not that one. Not that one. Uh, no. Oh god, I'm trying to find the um I'll go. Oh, yeah, I'll go. I knew I had it. Right. All right, well, we're looking at. We're going to quickly look at that one document that we didn't get to look at last night. And then we're going to have a look at the document by Cassie Ventura. The indictment she, they put up for her. Well, on her behalf. Right, what she's, what she's alleging happened. We say alleging because he has not been charged with anything at the moment. Right? I think the only ones that got him on are... Um, oh, God. Possible trafficking, S-trafficking, and... I can't think what the other thing is. But is they've not actually charged him with anything like what with any of the you know all these witnesses that are coming out and saying he's done this, he's done that, he's done that, he won't let me go, he had me hostage, he kidnapped me, all those people. He's not been charged with any of those yet that I know of. So allegedly, all that I'm gonna be reading tonight. Well, after the first document came out, after this, the second document will be allegedly. So, let's get on to this document because otherwise I'm just going to sort of lose it and not know what I'm doing. So, uh, USB drive, yeah, I have. Uh, got to find it now. This is it. This is the one we didn't get round to reading going through last night. Right? And let me just share it with you. Well, first of all, first of all, this is a true crime channel without the drama. Everything I say is purely in my opinion. Please do your own checks. If I'm wrong, please tell me I'm wrong. Because I don't know the full the full laws, how the how the USA works in their law. Right? All I know is I like how they charge people. They don't just charge them for child neglect. They break that charge down and put another six charges on top of it. Where in the UK you get charged with child neglect and that's it. Don't like that. I like how the USA do it. Right, so please make your own checks. This contains content that some may find disturbing. Some viewers may find the following footage deeply disturbing. Warning. Some viewers may find the following footage deeply disturbing. Warning. Some Right. I'm putting all my warnings out here for you lot. So please, if you're under 18, if you're under 18, please. Please leave, because you shouldn't be here. You should not be here.
Okay. I've got to get what I'm getting on brand. I just need to get my little picture up there in the corner. My trigger warning. And my banger going along the bottom. Okay. So please, if you're under 18, do not go any further than this. Please click the off button. Do not go any further. You shouldn't be able to get to my channel if you're under 18. But just in case. Because we know some people do lie about their ages. Okay. Now let's just set what I need to show up on the screen. Right, let me get this off. Let me down there. Right. right, we're going to be looking at a document, I'll zoom in if I can, let's see if I can zoom in something for you, if it'll let me, oh God's sake, let's go up to here, let's see if it'll let me know, yeah, all right. So we're looking at this document, and it, it was by email from the United States Attorney. Come on. Come on. Why won't it go down? I've got a feeling I can't have this on full screen. Okay. Let's do it this way, then. Right, so there it says, the hon the, by email, the Honourable Robin F. Tarnofsky, the United States Magistrate Judge, Southern District of New York, 500 Pearl Street, right? We, the United States, via Sean Coombs, a.k.a. Puff Daddy, a.k.a. P. Diddy, a.k.a. Diddy, a.k.a. P. D., a.k.a. Love, and so on. I could, add, I could add a few more AKAs to that. I'm sure a few other people could add a few more. Right, now this document goes into a lot more detail than the one we've... It's literally the same as the one we looked at last night, but it goes into a lot more detail. Right? And it's really to stop him from getting any... Like bond, it's just stop him from getting out. Keep that one while while I wait for it to go to trial. Dear Judge Tarnofsky, the defendant Sean Coombs, aka whatever, was taken into custody this morning after a grand jury sitting in this district returned a three count indictment charging him with crimes related to his decades-long pattern of physical and sexual violence against multiple victims and his use of force, threats, coercion to enact his will, protect his reputation and fulfill his sexual desires. The government respectfully sub respect oh, uh, the government respectfully submits this letter in anticipation of the defendant's appearance before this court later today. Right, so they sent it before. Right, sent it directly to the judge in anticipation of what the defence will try to do.
As set forth below, there is no condition or combination of well, I'm on, of conditions that will reasonably assure the appearance of the defendant as required and the safety of others and the community, not to mention the integrity of the proceedings, which I believe he shouldn't be out because if he's out, right, on bail, whatever, he's got use of a phone, yeah? He's got his family who can do the running around for him, yeah? Or get this message to such and such. Or take this letter to such and such. They take it to them. They read the letter. They do what he's asking them in that letter. They then probably, I don't know, could possibly burn it. They wouldn't know. So no, he shouldn't get out. He is a danger. He will try and he'll put pressure on the, any of these witnesses. Any of them. If released, he remains a serious risk of flight despite the conditions offered by his council. Yeah, his council did offer really good conditions, right? His passport, 50,000 whatever money uh, in house housebound, only his wife and his children and the mother to his children can come to the house. You know what I mean? Like I said, if they are loyal to him, they will do what he asks. And we all know what it's like if he wants something done. Most glaringly, the defendant also poses a significant risk of... Oh, where am I? I have... Obstructing justice. Indeed, as set forth below, during the course of the charged conduct, the defendant has attempted to bribe the security staff and threatened and interfered with witnesses to this criminal to his criminal conduct. He has already tried to obstruct the government's investigation of this case, repeatedly contacting victims and witnesses and feeding them false narratives of events as described in detail below. There are simply no conditions that would ensure that the defendant's efforts to obstruct and tamper with witnesses will stop. It's true. They will not be able to stop him from tampering with the witnesses. They wouldn't. Because, as you'll hear when we read Cassie's, they are that scared of him. They will do anything for him. If it means they don't get a slap or a beating or whatever, they will do whatever they have to. Right? There are simply no conditions that would ensure that the defendant's efforts to obstruct and tamper with witnesses will stop. The defendant, therefore, cannot overcome the statutory presumption in favour of detention and the should and the court should order him detained. They should, yeah. Background. Fine. Oh God. On September seventeenth, twenty twenty five. Oh, I'm thinking ahead of myself here. 2024, an indictment returned by a federal grand jury sitting in the Southern District of New York. The indictment was unsealed, charging the defendant with a racketeering conspiracy from in or about 2008 through on or about the date of the indictment in... All right. Violation of 18 U.S.C. 1962 D. Count 1. Sex trafficking from in or about 2009 through in or about 2018 in violation of 18 U.S.C. 1591 and 2. Count 2. 
and interstate transportation to engage in prostitution from in or about 2009 through in or about 2024 in violation of 18 U.S.C. 241 a and 2 count 3. So those are the charges so far. Since at least 2008, the defendant and other members and associates of the racketeering camp. Now, don't forget, when they talk about the racketeering enterprise, right, the enterprise is all of his businesses because they all do what he tells them. Right? All of his businesses are somehow involved in this racketeering, in these freak-offs, in these whatever, they are all somehow involved, in my opinion. And from what they are saying, I think they did believe that as well. Right, which includes the defendant's multifaceted business empire, the Coombs business, right? Will did the power and prestige of the defendant's reputation as a musician, entrepreneur, and figure in the entertainment industry to commit federal crimes, including racketeering, sex trafficking, and other offences. As charged in the, in the indictment, many of these crimes involved the SA and exploitation of women and other crimes of violence. Sex, trafficking and A. Using the power and prestige of the enterprise, the defendant lured female victims into the defendant's orbit, often under the pre pretense of a romantic relationship. The defendant then used force, threats of force, coercion, to cause those female victims to engage in SA, which included frequent sex acts with male commercial sex workers that the defendant referred to as free cops. Free cops were elaborate sex performances that the defendant arranged, directed, pleasured himself during and often electronically recorded. Free coughs occurred regularly from at least in or around 2009 from this year, sometimes lasted multiple days and frequently involved multiple sex workers. The defendant arranged free coughs with the assistance of members and associates of the enterprise, including employees of his business and the hotels where they were staged, often sustaining significant damages. Yeah. Right? That's why he gave his own staff go in and clean these rooms. Because they, they didn't want anyone from outside, in that hotel knowing exactly what was going on in those rooms. You know what I mean? And if there's any damage like lamps broken, you know what I mean? The defendant ensured the victims would participate in free coughs through coercion and violence. For instance, the defendant provided control substances, including, I'm not so going to read them out, to drugs, D-R-U-G-S, to female victims so they could and would continue to engage in free coughs. Despite fatigue, physical and emotional exhaustion and pain, additionally, both during free coughs and separate from free coughs, the defendant subjected female victims to physical, emotional and verbal abuse, in part to cause them to engage in free cops. The defendant hit, kicked, threw objects at and dragged female victims, sometimes by the hair. At least a dozen witnesses will confirm that they personally observed the defendant's violence towards women 
and all injuries sustained by women at the defendant's hands. One incident of physical abuse occurred when a female victim was attempting to leave the hotel following a March 2016 freak This abuse was captured on video surveillance and publicly reported in May 2024. The defendant's assault then often resulted in serious injuries to the victim that took days or weeks to heal. Hey! Hey! Shush! Shush! Come on. Sorry about that. Right, now these, these sub, sub peggings here are interesting. For example, in approximately 2012 in Mattinger Home, the defendant paid over $46,000 to cover damages to a penthouse hotel room following a freak. What the hell? $46,000. What did they damage? Did they knock holes in walls and break windows out and all that? Like, feck's sake. An excerpt of this video footage is attacks. I've got the video footage. That's what I was looking for. But I'm not going to show it until I read the next piece of work. I'm not going to go, because this is, what, 16 pages. The defendant also coerced victims into participate, participating in free costs by controlling their careers, finances, livelihood, livelihood and or housing, among other aspects of their lives, or by threatening to decimate recordings of free cops. The defendant used the considerable wealth and influence to make victims rely on him financially. For example, by paying for the rent or the cars or by offering them career opportunities. Once he provided this support, the defendant repeatedly threatened to take it away to ensure the victim's com compliance with his demands, including their participation in free cops. This is why, 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 this isn't why, but I've always been that woman, like, I would never, never relied on a man, never. I've been married, but I never relied on him for anything, right, nothing. I... Didn't have to go to work while my kids were little. So, yeah, okay. I relied on... You could say I relied on him there. But that was my choice to do that. I could have gone to work if I wanted to. And eventually, as my children got older, I did go back to work. So I wasn't relying on him all the time. Right, I knew that if, if say I had to leave my husband, right, I knew in my own self that I could do it without his support. That's what I'm trying to say, right? I knew I could walk away from my marriage or whatever, with, and know that I could, I'd be okay. I'd, I'd be able to deal with it and everything without his support. And this is a problem. A lot of these women now are so financially dependent on him, they don't see how they can survive living that lifestyle they had, keeping that lifestyle they had without his support. Indeed, victims believe they could not refused the defendant's demands that they engaged in free coughs without risking their financial security, which I've just mentioned, or career prospects, or without repercussions in the form of physical or emotional abuse. Well, that's it. If they let him out, right? Say they gave him bond, bail. His wife or his girlfriend to, and the mother to two of his sons I, so, I would be so complicit to him 
that they are scared of him, they won't admit it. They're scared of him, right? And they will do anything he says. So they can't give him bail, they can't. Earl of violence. In addition to the defendant's physical, sexual and emotional abuse of his romantic partners, the defendant repeatedly engaged in acts of violence directed towards his employees and others. As charged in indictment, the defendant often assisted by members and associates of the enterprise engaged in kidnapping, cries, arson, yeah, we heard about them. Physical violence, such as throwing objects at people, we heard about that. Throwing people to the ground, we've seen that. Hitting, dragging, yep, seen that. Choking and shoving others. Numerous witnesses, including the defendants, employees and others, observed or experienced violence from the defendants first time and sustained lasting trauma as a result. So to get that, to be able to say, including the defendant's, defendant's employees, they must have spoke to some of his ex-employees. Right? Right, for example, in the early hours of Monday, December 22nd, 2011, the defendant and a close conspirator kidnapped an individual at gunpoint to facilitate breaking into and entering the residence of another multiple witnesses were testified at trial to the events surrounding the kidnapping and breaking and the latter of which is corroborated by police reports and other records. Wow. Approximately two weeks later, the defendant's co-conspirators set fire to individual, one's, individual one vehicle by slicing open a car's convertible top and dropping a Molotov cocktail inside the interior. Police and fire department reports extensively documented the arson and concluded that the fire was intentionally set. Multiple, multiple witnesses would also testify to the defendant bragging about his result, role in destroying individual one's car. Well, I think I've got the name of that person whose car it was. I'm not sure if it was, I'm not sure if I'm, I have been told, but I'm not sure if I wrote it, wrote it down. More broadly, since at least 2008, allegations of the defendant's physical ABUSE of women and others have been publicly reported in the media, including in Hollywood blogs and on podcasts. Law enforcement reports corroborate, corroborate that police responded to step to several instances of the defendant's violence, including assaults against victims and other individuals. More recently, there has been an outpouring of other public allegations against the defendant, including claims of threats and physical and S violence, sexual violence dating as far back as oh, 2019 to 2000. That's 34 Coming on to like 34 years, you know what I mean? This is ridiculous. Surely someone in like 10 years after he first started could have said something. But then again, it was the 1990s and anything and everything went. You know what I mean? All right. There you are, see, so he's got Joy, Joy Dickerson, Neil, V. Coombs, right? Complaint filed on November 23rd, 2023. Lisa Gardner, V. Coombs. Complaint filed on November 27th, 
2023 and we moved to and we moved to New Jersey Federal Court on July the 12th, 2024. Joe versus Coombs, she didn't want to say it, tell her name. This one was filed on December the 6th, 2023. Crystal McKinney v Coombs. Complaint filed on May the 21st, 2024. And Dawn Richards v Coombs. Complaint filed on September the 10th, 2024. Wow. So many. Violent tendencies are widening on, however, at no point during the past few decades has the threat of public exposure or law enforcement intervention deterred the defendant from continuing his abuse. Because he was paying off certain police. I think so, anyway, in my opinion. I really do. He had some police in his pocket. People like that always have someone in the police in their pocket. They always do. Right, about firearms. Hmm. The defendant and members of the enterprise, including the defendant's security personnel at times, carried firearms, and the defendant himself carried it and brandished firearms to intimidate and threaten others. Indeed, some victims were aware of the defendant's access to firearms. On one occasion, the defendant forced a female victim to carry a firearm on his behalf, and on another occasion, he pointed a firearm at a female victim. Hmm. Now, if we are to believe this story from Kim's last words, right? He put a gun, pointed a gun to her head, didn't he? But he said, "Ah, oh, that's just uh, like scare taxi ta tactics." I wouldn't use, I wouldn't shoot you. The defendant continued to have access to guns, including illegal firearms. In March 2024, during searches of the defendant's residence, Florida and Los Angeles, California, law enforcement seized firearms and ammunition, including three AR-15s, each with defaced serial numbers. Why would the serial number be scored off? Those guns, I think, this is why I said they need to look at the history of those guns. Because the only reason I can see that was the serial number would be uh, tried to be hidden or removed is because it's got a a, like a body on it. It's been used before. Two of the three defaced AR-15s were found in the defendant's Miami bedroom closet, stored, broken, down in parts, along with magazines that were lo loaded with ammunition. Hmm. In addition, six legally purchased guns with serial numbers. See, it was illegal. These are legal, so the serial numbers haven't been removed. So I think those guns where the serial numbers have been removed are because they've got a body on them. So they need to look at the history. And by doing that, they've only got to assemble those guns, right? Just assemble them, put some ammunition in it. Fire one round off into the water or whatever they use, right? And then run it through their system, their computers, to see if that bullet is matching up with any other bullets taken from any other homicides or drive-by shootings or anything like that. In sum, the defendant's regular use of fire, violence and threat of violence, as well as the coercion described above against the victims and others, 
Foster the court's affair in which these individuals believed they were unable to reject the defendant's demands without subjecting themselves to physical violence or ABUSC. Searching of the firearm seized during Mars searches were licensed to a current member of Coombe's security staff. Coombs has employed other security staff members with significant criminal history. Yeah, we know, involved, including violent crimes and firearm offences. Yeah, we know. So, God, this just goes on about how it's by witnesses and obstructed justice. Right. Within days of that incident at the hotel, right, I, first of all, he tried to bribe her, the staff there, that wasn't having him. The defending staff contacted other members of hotel security. At the same time, staff members were in close communication with the victim of the assault as well, all in an effort to cover up the defendant's assault and to prevent the incident from being publicly disclosed. Within days of the incident, the surveillance video disappeared from the hotel server. Well, I'm just so glad that someone has a, had a conscience. You know what I mean? And released it. <sighs> Similarly, throughout the period charged in the indictment, members and associates of the enterprise have reached out to multiple victims on behalf of the defendant to convince them not to report the defendant's abuse. Hmm. Most recently, in late 2023, immediately following public allegations of certain of the defendant's crimes, including his physical and essay of women, the defendant and other members of the enterprise made repeated phone calls to victims and witnesses, during which they provided victims and witnesses with false narratives of events, in an apparent effort to conceal the defendant's crimes. On at least two occasions, the defendant recorded those calls on a co-conspirator's cell phone, therefore attempting to obscure his involvement in the obstruction. Hmm, yeah. Right, so, it's just... This is why he should not get bail. It's, I hope... Apparently he's got a new, a new lawyer, a new attorney. So he's going again to try for a third time. Please make it three times. Strike, you're out. Do not come back. You know what I mean? So he's trying again a third time now. I don't know if he's still got his ever attorney or he's got... He's still got that thing and he's just got another attorney on it as well. Or whether he's got rid of that attorney and got a new one. That I'm not quite sure of. You know what I mean? I couldn't... I heard about him and think, so has he got rid of his old one? Or has he still got the old attorney but just brought another attorney to work alongside that attorney? Because some do that. They have two different companies working together. The government investigation is ongoing. Yeah, no. Uh. 
This is literally the same as what we was reading yesterday. But like I said, it just goes in, it's just a lot more, as I would say, word salad, because I don't understand what they're saying half the time. Like, you know, when someone's talking to you and you stand, stand there and you're looking out and you can see the lips moving and you can see, a, you can hear a sound coming from those lips, but you don't know what the hell they're talking about. And you stand there just nodding your head and go, yeah, 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 that, all right, yeah. You know what I mean? Just like that. Just stand there and yog and you, like one of them yoggy dogs in the back of the car. Every time the car moves and yog, nods. You're just like that, yeah. And this is just a lot of that. It's word salad again. It's just repeating itself about the violence, the kidnapping, the arson, kicking, pushing, slamming them against walls and on the ground. Like, this disposition to violence cannot be reasonably prevented through bail countries. It can't, you know. Exactly. All these, a lot of these uh, violence things, uh, charges of violence, happened in his home. Right? In his home. So what's stopping him just because he's on house arrest? What's stopping him from assaulting his partner or the mother to his children? You know what I mean? Nothing. There's nothing stopping him. In sum, the defendant's long history of violent conduct makes clear that the event, that even the most stringent bail conditions will not suffice to ensure the safety of the community. It wouldn't. He'd still get out to his little minions by using his the mother to his children and his girlfriend because he's got a girlfriend, he's got a two-year-old. Right? He's probably paying for where she lives. I'm paying for all her, for whatever she needs. So she's going to be, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll take that better. No problem. Yep. And she'll come out, put the little toddler in the car, make out, say, just going to the park with the toddler. She can leave the house. He can't. So she gets in the car, drives away, meets up with someone, no passing out on. Whatever's in that note, we, if, there, if there ever was. But that's what could happen if he got bail. There's a phone. But I don't think he'd, I think he'd be a bit stupid using a phone. Because all his phones are going to be tapped. They'll be listening in on every phone call. On his house phone, on his mobiles, on her mo- them, his wife's mobiles, his children's mobile phones. Everything would be tapped. Because he might think, well, I'll, I'll use my uh, daughter's phone. They won't, you know what I mean? No, they'll have his daughter's phones tapped. His son's phones tapped. His girlfriend's phones tapped. I'm sure it's a lot cheaper to keep him in prison. Or jail, or whatever they call it. Right. Uh, for example, on or about November nineteenth, November nineteen, uh, November nineteenth, twenty twenty three, just three days after the filing of the lawsuit, lawsuit described above, the defendant made multiple calls to another victim of his essay, and recorded certain. 
of those calls using the South Oak of a co-conspirator. During the calls, the defendant repeatedly asked for the victim's support and friendship and attempted to convince the victim that she had willingly engaged in acts constituting SI. The defendant also showed the victim that if she needed the defendant too, she ain't got worry about nothing else. A thinly veiled attempt to coerce the victim into adopting and supporting the defendant's false version of events to protect the defendant. Yep. So, it just goes on like that. It's never ending with this guy. Never ending. Right, he will do anything. Anything to get out of these charges. So if he got bail, they would. He would straight away. All those people are listed, right? He'd have someone threatening them, bombarding them with phone calls. Their cars. They wouldn't be safe. They would not be safe driving in a car. They wouldn't be safe in their home. They just would not be safe. Right, let's have a look what right, other documents is there. Oh, yeah. uh, see, that was the detention memo. That's the memo, the email they sent to the judge, really. Just literally outlining everything to make sure that they detained him in jail. Right. No, we don't need that one. We are now going to go up to, is it that one? Not this one. Oh no, that's another model. That was 2003. This one is from... Uh -huh. Right. I think this is the one we want. Right, let's just have a look. I have gone through this already and I blanked out certain words. Um. Right, let's just get this up on the screen for you. Right, so as you can see, this is Supreme Court of the State of New York, County of New York. This is April. No, Lamp no, 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 no. This ain't the one I want. This ain't the one I want. I want. Thank you. This is it. Yeah, this is the one. Yes, I have blanked out this one. Right. So, let's just get this one up there. See, I've got so many pieces of work. Uh pieces of information that I'm getting confused with them. So many. Then I'm thinking, have I got that one? 
I hear that the person is putting a like uh, a charge in against him. I'm thinking, have they got have I got their indictments? And I never have my book on me when I'm in the living room and I should. You know what I mean? It wouldn't take me five seconds to get up and get my book from out off my table. But I never think of coming into the balcony and getting my book. All right, this is a complaint by Cassandra Ventura Cassie. Right? Again, against Sean Coombs. Bad Boy Entertainment, Bad Boy Records, Epic Records, Coombs Enterprises, LLC and Joe Corps 1 to 10. Complaint, jury trial demand. So she wants it to go to trial. Right? Trigger warning. This document contains highly graphic information of a sexual nature, including SA. Right? Let's see if I can get it up a bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is that better for you? Yep, yep. Plaintiff, 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 Cassandra Ventura, Miss Ventura, he by alleges as and for her complaint against defendant Sean Combs, Mr. Combs, Bad Boy Entertainment, Bad Boy Records, Epic Records, Com Combs, and he's like, he could lose all this. Right? Preliminary statement. Defe one, defendant Sean Coombs is a rapper and record executive popularly known by his stage name Puff Daddy, P Daddy, B P Diggy or Diggy. Mr Coombs came to fame in the early 1990s with his record label Bad Boy Records. He rose to prominence in the music and entertainment industry over the decades and is regularly referred to as a hip-hop mo hip mogul. In 2022, Mr. Coombs received a Lifetime Achievement Award at the BET Awards. I wonder if they take that off him. During his acceptance speech, Mr. Coombs stated, I have to give a special shout-out, thank you, love to the people that, real that was really there for me. He named a number of people before adding, and also Cassie for holding me down in the dark times. So more like you holding her down, mate. One. Three. The truth, however, is that Cassie, Miss Cassandra Ventura, was held down by Mr. Coombe and George had over a decade of his violent behaviour and disturbed demands. For Miss Ventura, the dark times were those she spent trapped by Mr. Coombs in a cycle of violent, blank violence and sex trafficking among violent and unlawful acts. Mr. Coombs are, right, Mr. Coombs are Mrs. Ventura in her own home after she tried to leave him. Often punched, beat, kicked and stomped on Miss Ventura, resulting in bruises, burst lips, black eyes and bleeding. Blew up a man's car after he learned that he was romantically interested in Miss Ventura. Just because the bloke was had an interest, thought like saying, oh I like her. You know what I mean? I could be in there with her. He's gone and blown his car up, which we spoke about in the last piece of work, where he cut the top of the roof open, put a, a cocktail of whatever in, forced Miss Ventura to get engaged in blank with male sex workers while pleasuring himself and filming the encounters. Ran out of his apartment with a uh, with a blank in pursuit of a rival. In, oh, he ran out of the part his apartment with a I should imagine G U N P 
pursuit in pursuit of a rival industry executive whom he learned was nearby. Christ. Demanded that Ms. Ventura ca to carry his GUA in her purse just to make her uncomfortable and demonstrate how dangerous he is. Introduced Miss Ventura to a lifestyle of excessive alcohol and substance ABUSE and required her to procure illicit prescriptions to satisfy his own addictions. Well, he's been locked up now for what, a week? Over a week now? A week today? I think he's having some withdrawal symptoms by now, don't you? Miss Ventura Miss, met Mr. Coombs in 2005 when she was 19 years old and he was 37 years old. He signed her to his label, Bad Boy Records. And within a few years, lured, lured Miss Ventura into ostentatious, fast paced and GRUG fueled lifestyle and into a romantic, romantic relationship with him. Her boss, one of the most powerful men in the entertainment industry, and a vicious, cruel and controlling man, nearly two decades her senior. Mr. Coombs asserted complete control over Miss Ventura's personal and professional life, thereby ensuring her inability to escape his own. He provided unprecedented... We've got 35 pages of this to get through. Uh, avenues for successful aspiring artists, but in return demanded obedience, loyalty, and silence. Right, I've just got a. Go and get a drink because my throat's starting to hurt. I'll just put some music on for you. Okay. While I sort this out, because my throat will start to hurt if I don't get a drink. Uh -huh. Where was it? Where was it? He wrote that. I So instinctive and so passionate Every word I move so descriptive like an adjective I got a vendetta against people who patented Being negative when you should be getting after it I got facts over facts over tracks This and that spitting slow, spitting fast I could roast, I could gas, think I'm okay at last But I don't know if that can erase all the past And the pettiness, a reflection of the emptiness Hilarious, you think you're worth my time You're delirious, mysterious Because you are behind a fake exterior Inferior, you know I'll always be a bit superior Get off of me, this ain't no humble brag I want you to hear words, you can say them back I want you to feel free from the chains at last And to believe in what you got, it was built to last Yeah now that I've been put through, I never got anyone's help, I had to do it all myself. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit, I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up and make a statement. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take shit, I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up. Make a statement I'm Gonna learn the consequence of being incompetent Mental health is confidence Dreams and some honestness I'm not here to save the day That's for you to take away I could play a million mind games But instead of say Something not illogical Something that is topical Rub it on and watch it go Make yourself unstoppable Dreams are irresponsible But they're always possible If you just believe You could be so remarkable Thoughts in my head A collage and they spread I'll be great one day Going off of my meds No, I'm not giving up No, I'm not giving in I will make it to the top Taking off in the wind, I gotta make it I'm saving every day to taste it I'm patient, but my mind, it can hardly take it I'm chasing a dream that I've had for several ages of bacon Modern kingdom for the taking Now that I've been put through 
Right, I'm back. Pack me drink. Right, let's have a little bit of this drink first. Oh, God. This is what I needed. Right, sorry about that. I should have got made so I had a drink before I started. Right. Right, we're up to number six, aren't we? Throughout their relationship, Mr. Kim was prone to uncontrollable rage and frequently be beat Miss Ventura savagely. These beatings were witnessed by Mr. Kim's staff and employees at Bad Boy Entertainment. And Mr. Coombs related businesses. But no one dared to speak up against their frightening. I'm sorry, but I know they say a job is a job. Yeah. But. I'd have just resigned and left. I wouldn't have even told them. I would have just packed up a bag of clothes and disappeared. And not go back there. And then, once I knew I was safe, get in touch with the FBI. You know what I mean? Because I can stand there and see a young woman, a young girl being beaten and so badly. I couldn't. I'd be tempted to pick a chair up and lamp it over his head. Following these episodes of horrific abuse, Mr. Coombs would immediately attempt to hide Miss Ventura and the ev evidence of his violent rage. He often showed her with gifts following incidents of his physical violence, a typical behaviour of a serial abuse, a typical behaviour of a narcissistic file piece of SHIT. And I can assure you, there's words going round about others, so it's not. Well, at least one other, so he's not the only one. But there's probably other actors or music people. Don't have to be in hip hop, could be in country, could be in any aspect of the music industry. Yeah? Thinking, oh, listen, I think we need to calm down what we're doing. You know what I mean? Until this blows over. Because there's going to be loads of others doing this. We said when what's his name got caught. That other piece of SHIT. And his sidekick. Right, he was now in jail, and he he apparently he he committed suicide. He didn't. He was took out. He had some names, big names, and they didn't want him getting them big names out. And if they're not careful, the same thing is going to happen here with Mister Coombs. Because those big names cannot afford to be. Out. So Coombs is probably telling his defence attorneys, get hold of these people, tell them to get me out of here, otherwise I'm going to tell them. So you see, if he gets bailed, then I want to know why. 
or how he managed to get bail. Oh, let's just turn this one like that. Right, how or why? Because he shouldn't get bail, but I would be gutted if he gets bail. We just had an incident in the UK where our government thought, oh, right, uh, our prisons are over full. Right? We need to make space. So what we're going to do, we're going to release so many thousand. Yeah? Non-violent criminals. Like people in there for, I don't know, fraud, shoplifting, a bit of handing out of, even though I don't agree with it, a bit of handing out of drugs or maybe a runner, a drug runner. Um, someone not paying their TV licence or someone not paying their council tax. Honest, that's how it is in the UK. Right, those are the people that should have been released. No, no, no. And we kept saying, people kept saying on YouTube, no, families have been advised, families who's got victims, uh, like daughters, right, from domestic violence cases, whose partners are in prison for domestic, violent domestic violence cases. Very violent, right? Uh, just to let you know, such and such will be released on such and such a date. What? Are you kidding me? I've got to get out of here. I've got to move. It's going to, it's going to come straight here. He knows where I live. He knows where my, I've got the kids. I've got to get out. So these women are like that. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? A bit, is, they're releasing him. And so people are saying this on YouTube, on these other channels, and all this lot, on podcasts and everything, before those was actually released. Then, was it last week or the week before? The government realised, oh, we made a mistake. We released 30 prisoners that should not have been released. Ooh, we was telling you this before you actually released them, but you wasn't listening to you, us, was you, Starmer? RPM, he was not listening to anyone. He knew best, and he released this, thir well, more than 30 altogether, but 30 of them are very dangerous. They managed to get so many back, right? But so many others have gone underground. I thought, you're not going to find them. Unless they commit an offence, you're not going to find them. So it just shows the government do not listen to their public, to their constituents. They don't listen. No, they know best. And this is what's going to happen here if he gets bailed. Someone's saying, no, it's not going to be like that. I can guarantee you it's not like that. Mr. Coombs, no. These stories you're hearing, you know, they're just in it for the money. You know what I mean? They're going to get him back. If he gets bailed, I would be. Anyway, in addition to the physical assault, Mr. Coombs frequently reminded Miss Ventura of his ability to cause serious harm, whether by requiring her to carry his GUN in her purse or by blowing up the car of a musician that was romantically interested. He was interested. He didn't make any advances. He was just interested in Ms. Ventura. Blew the car up. Adding insult to injury, Mr. Coombs used illegal substances and threats of violence to force Ms. Ventura into repeated unwanted blank with mail sex workers. Over the years that Mr. Coombs, I should have blanked that out, abused Miss Ventura blank and blank, she again and again tried to escape his tight hold. Hold on, I've just got to blank this out because that's just going to do my heading. 
Ah, bad, bad. I know it's only a little way, but if I want to put any of these documents up on my community wall, I have to, because YouTube are very funny. Right, Ty told, told over a life. Every time she hit Mr. Coombs, vast neck. Every time she hit, oh, every time she hit, Mr. Coombs, vast network of co corporations and affiliated entities found her. And those who work for Mr. Coombs companies implored her to return to it. Many went as far to explicitly state that her failure to return to Mr. Coombs would hinder her success in the entertainment industry. When she believed she had finally separated from her long-time abuser, she joined Mr. Coombs for dinner. After which he forced her into her home and ah her, while she repeatedly said no and pushed her to push him away. Miss Ventura has now fully escaped Mr. Coombs, but the harm and assault and blank he caused her to experience for nearly a decade will forever haunt her. She required intensive medical and psychological care to recover from the trauma she lived through. I'll tell you something. I'd have been on the alcohol and my drugs myself. He wouldn't have had to give me any of that. Just a thought of having to live with someone like him. I'd say, give me the alcohol, give me them drugs, give it me now. You know what I mean? I, I don't know how anyone could live with anyone like that for so long. I know what they're saying. It's not easy to get away. It isn't, and I understand that. But for sake. Uh, she is required intense. She cannot, however, continue to live in silence about what she enjoyed. No. Well done, sweetheart. Stand up to the piece of SHIT. Do not back down. You've got a lot of people on her on her side. A lot of people. She's not alone here. She's not alone. She, Mr. Combs, she cannot, however, Mr. Combs remains immensely powerful and immensely dangerous. Yep. Miss Ventura therefore seeks justice for the decade of her life that Mr. Coombs took away from her with threats of violence, excessive use of DRUGS, physical and psychological abuse, and sexual slavery. Accordingly, Miss Ventura brings this action seeking injunctive declaration and monetary relief from defendant, against defendants in a in violation of federal sex trafficking laws. All right? And he's got all the laws. He's got New York State Human Rights Law, New York City Human Rights Law, the Gender Motivated Violence Act, New York Service for Victims of Human Trafficking, the California, California Blank and Cover Up Accountability Act, and the California Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Wow. They are throwing everything at him, aren't they? They are throwing everything. This is what I like about the USA, and how they break every charge down. Right? Here, right, you get done for child neglect. That's it, child neglect. In the USA, child neglect, and then you've got six other counts, which all carry separate charges. Yeah? And so instead of just doing, I don't know, in the UK, maybe two years for child neglect, say five years for child neglect, yeah? You've got six other charges on top, all carrying up to five years. 
So six fives. 35 years. At max. Yeah? If that's a minimum charge of five years. But in the UK, you just get the one charge. Which is what? Charlie Collect oh well. Send it for two two years on probation. What? She's just neglected a child, the child has died, and you're giving her two years? Right, okay. That's our justice system for you. Sex offenders. Don't even get me going on sex offenders in the UK. That's a totally different story on sex offenders in the UK. It's like, oh, we've got this sex offender, okay. What did you do? And you tell him the charges? Okay. He's remanded on parole. Six months. Six months at parole. And you think, and then someone who goes up for a bit of, like, say, fraud, defrauding the government, maybe, or all their works, yeah? They can get up to 10 years. They've hurt no one. They haven't killed no one. They haven't injured anyone. They haven't hurt any child. Nothing. But those who hurt children get away with a slap on the hand in the UK. Why do you think we've got all these illegal immigrants risking their lives to get over to the UK? Because once they're over here, they are... I'm not saying all of them. I'm not saying all of them. Some of them might legitimately want to be in the UK. 99% of them don't. They're here for one... Well, two things. Well, three things. One, the money. Two, the free housing. Actually, it's more than two things. One money, two free housing, health care... Oh, yeah, and don't, yeah, let's not forget our, our young children and women walking around, coming home from night, from work at night time, walking from the train or the bus stop or whatever, and getting assaulted and attacked and injured and sometimes even killed. But don't worry, it's just a poor little immigrant. Ooh, don't get me started on that. Right, uh, let's see what it says because it's a police partner. Right, parties, we go to these parties. Plaintiff Cassandra Ventura is a resident of the state of California and Connecticut and was employed by defendant Bad Boy Records. Ah, oh, come on, the name. Bad Boy Records. Come on. Doesn't that tell you something about the person who runs it? Bad Boy Records. At all relevant times, even Miss Ventura met the definition of an employer of defendants under all relevant statutes. Defendant Sean Coombs, upon information and belief, resides within the state of California at all relevant times, even Mr. Coombs met the, de met the def definition of an employer of plaintiff under all relevant statutes. Defendant Bad Boy Entertainment is a music media and entertainment company which is going to be closed down very soon. So, anyone under that record label, I would advise you to start trying to find a new record label. One that is honest and has morals. Defendant Bad Boy Records is a Delaware Limited liability company with a principal place of business located in New York. Okay, so, um, oh. we need to go down for this. Let's just go for all of these ones. Factual allegations. Teenaged Miss Ventura meets middle-aged Mr. Coombs as her career begins. Right, Miss Ventura 
You know, when I, when I think of the name Ventura, I keep thinking of that film, or was it a film, as Ventura? I keep thinking of that. Miss Ventura miss, met Mr. Coombs in late 2005 or early 2006. After Mr. Coombs heard Miss Ventura's first single playing in a nightclub, and expressed interest in signing her to the label, Bad Boy Records. Right. At the time, Miss Ventura was 19 years old. Miss Chickens was 37. Final piece of shit. Within months, in February 2006, Miss Ventura signed a 10 album deal with Mr. Coombs' record label. Miss Ventura's first album, Cassie, was released in August 2006, deb debuting at number four on the US Billboard 200. To promote this album, Miss Ventura made television appearances on MTV's Total Request Live and BET's 106 and Park. Miss Ventura suffered from a significant performance anxiety during these appearances, and press outlets were highly critical of Miss Ventura's performance on these shows. Mr. Coombs, however, sought to rehabilitate his newly signed talent, talent MTV News. You could hear the nervousness in your voice, and to be honest, I kind of smiled at it. Because it made me really appreciate what I really love about her. She's a regular person. It just made me appreciate that she's got nervous and it's kind of cute to me, to be honest. You've got to understand that success for her is coming out of nowhere. It's just so huge and sometimes everybody handles it differently. Which I, I agree with him there. That's one thing I do agree with him. She was 19. You know what I mean? And then you know you gotta be criticised by all these media people. Nah, media should be more sympathetic towards people like this. While paternalistic is noting that it was cute to him, regular Miss Ventura appeared with Mr. Coombs. Comments rang true to some extent. With Hank signing with Bad Boy Records, Miss Ventura was quickly thrust into the spotlight and was unfamiliar with how to navigate with her, navigate her new celebrity status. Exactly. Mr. Coombs' recognition and glorification of Miss Ventura's naivety proved to set the groundwork for his manipulatory and coercive romantic a sexual relationship is meant. Yeah, he could see the vulnerability in her there. She was vulnerable there. Yeah, he picked up on that. He knew. If, he, if she could come out there and headstrong, right, knew what she was doing and knew what she was saying and knew what she wanted, yeah, he would have stood a chance with her because he knew then. That he didn't know, oh, I'm not going to be able to get away with it with her. She's not going to stand for it. Right? But because he, he knew she was vulnerable, he, he got her. Yeah, we miss Venture, a woman nearly two decades his junior. Right. Within a year of signing with Bad Boy Records, Mr. Coons became deeply entrenched in Miss Ventura's life. Almost immediately, a certain possession and control over her, inserting himself into all aspects of her career and personal life. In November 2006, Mr. Coons invited Miss Ventura to perform his song, Come To Me. I think that song's got a, another meaning to it. You know what I mean? If you think about it. Along with him at the MTV Europe Music Awards in Copenhagen, Denmark. After rehearsal for the performance, Mr. Coombs walked around in a robe with a drink in his hand. 
launching his lavish party lifestyle to his label's newly signed artist. During hair and makeup leading up to the performance, Miss Ventura's hairstylist and Mr. Coon's makeup artist told Miss Ventura that Mr. Coon was interested in Miss Ventura. Miss Ventura shrugged off the gossip and, in fact, expressed disgust given the large age gap between her and the president of her record label. Emphasizing, emphasizing the age and power dynamic early on in the working relationship, Mr. Coon positioned himself as a father figure and protector of Miss Ventura. By way of example, after returning to New York after trip to Las Vegas, Joe was seen during a brief hospital stay. Miss Ventura, who was by, who by then was fully healthy, went out to a club with her friends. Right? When Mr. Coons saw her out, he reprimanded her, telling her to go home and take care of herself. At the time, Miss Ventura thought that her record label was looking out for her well-being and that Mr. Coons had her best interest in mind, which I could fully understand. She's, what, 19, maybe coming on to 20? She'd been ill. She'd just come out of hospital. Yeah? But no, that isn't what he's doing, love. Mr. Coombs also ensured he was intertwined with Miss Ventura's personal and social life. For instance, by inviting himself to Miss Ventura's spring first birthday party in Las Vegas. He also brought along famous musicians and producers, thereby flaunting his celebrity status and influence in front of a young and impressionable Miss Ventura. Although Mr. Coombs knew that Miss Ventura was in a relationship at the time, and even though he was publicly in a relationship with Kim Porter, Mr. Coombs nevertheless pursued Miss Ventura. At an, at an after party in Hotel Suite following Miss Ventura's 21st birthday party, Mr. Coombs pulled Miss Ventura into the bathroom and forcibly kissed her. Miss Ventura did not consent to the unwanted contact. She immediately ran out of the bathroom and the hotel suite and cried. She told her best friend at the time about what had happened but was too scared to tell anyone else. At the Video Music Awards the following day, Miss Ventura's boyfriend at the time joined her and Mr. Coombs at a table at the award ceremony. Mr. Coombs became angry, telling Miss Ventura that the invitation to the world ceremony was only for her and not for her significant other. You know what I mean? That you want to that isn't the way to, to go about it, you know what I mean? He could have still won her over without being so nasty. You know what I mean, so. Right. Um, where are we? Oh. Keep going, keep going. Mr. Coombs lures lo 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 Miss Venture into a relationship. Despite her clear rejection of Mr. Coombs' advances, Mr. Coombs continued to demand Miss Ventura spend time with him, including for a weekend at Mr. Coombs' residence in Miami and for four nights out in New York City. And for nights 
as to New York City, okay? On one particular night around September 2007, Mr. Coombs insisted on taking Miss Ventura out. Miss Ventura acquiesced, acquiesced, fearing that rejecting, acquiesced, fearing that rejecting Mr. Coombs' request would have repercussions for her album deal with Mr. Coombs and his company, Bad Boy Records. Mr. Coombs picked up Miss Ventura from her apartment in Manhattan in a blue luxury vehicle. Miss Ventura was surprised that when she got into the car, Mr. Coombs was already inebriated. He handed her a pill and told her to take him. When Miss Ventura asked what the pill was, Mr. Coombs dismissed her and told her she would like it. So later learned the pill was... Right? I'm not saying it. It's there. Something Miss Ventura had never tried before and did not want to try. This was the first time Mr. Coombs got Miss Ventura high. Mr. Coombs then proceeded to drive recklessly at high speeds down the west side highway of Manhattan. Miss Ventura was very scared but did not dare to object to Mr. Coombs, who appeared drunk, high and agitated. Mr. Coombs took Miss Ventura to an upscale lounge in downtown Manhattan where he proceeded to get an altercation with the security staff who would not permit Mr. Coombs to enter, presumably because he'd be ligering. Yeah. And Ms. Ventura decided to go home. But for the reminder of the, reminder of the night, Mr. Coombs mis- messaged Ms. Ventura incessantly complaining that he left, that she'd say, she, that she left him high and alone. I had left him a lot more. I have never even got in the car with you, mate. You know what I mean? Where are the police? I don't know police about on the streets, in the cars, in their little cars, hiding around corners. Wait for someone to go speeding past them. In early fall 2007, Mr. Coombs flexed his power and influence when he paid a promoter to create a fake flyer for a party hosted by Miss Ventura. Hmm. Diamond's done now. This fake posting allowed Miss Ventura to have an excuse to go to Miami, Florida and get her away from her boyfriend by using the guise of a legitimate event she had to attend. Miss Ventura was stunned at how easily Mr. Coombs was able to create others to lie for him. Hmm. Miss Ventura was uncomfortable with the fake flyer, but because the request to go to Miami was made by the owner of her record label and because she was scared to go against his wishes and face repercussion to a nascent career, Miss Ventura agreed to join Mr. Coombs in Florida. Come on, do you all want to, are you that desperate to become music people, you know what I mean? To have a career in, music, in the music career. I wouldn't want a music career. If I could sing, I would not want a music career. Yep. During this trip to Miami, Mr. Coombs provided Miss Ventura's copious amount of DRGS. She became more intoxicated than ever before, and her intoxication lasted throughout the weekend. As she wanted Mr. Coombs to come to continue to support her career. She felt she could not refuse Mr. Coombs, 
urging us to take more DRUGS. <sighs> After providing her with DRUGS, Mr. Coombs had blank with Miss Ventura during this trip. Within two years of visiting Mr. Coombs, Miss Ventura found herself lured into the immediate circle of her boss, the owner of a record club and among the most powerful men in the entertainment industry. Three. Mr. Coombs exerts control over Miss Ventura's career. God, we're only on page 10. From the start of their relation, Mr. Coombs exerted his power and influence over Miss Ventura. This dynamic was fueled by their nearly 20 year age difference. I can't say much about age difference. I really can't. Because my children's father, he was 11 years older than me. I was 19 when I met him. He was 30. Right. So, um, I can't really say, oh, he's a bit old. Like, if my daughter came up to me when she was 18 or 19 and said, with her, with her partner, and I found out he was like 10, 11 years older. I can say, well, he is a bit old for you, isn't he? I couldn't be that because that, that to me, I'd be a bit hypocritical. So I don't look on age as being wrong, right? As long as that person treats my daughter, treat, was to treat my daughter well, then fine. But actually, actually, my daughter found her partner, who she's got a, a lovely little boy with, and he's actually five years younger than her. You know what I mean? So, as well as their relative positions in the entertainment industry, Miss, with Mr. Coombs considered a music mogul and Miss Ventura at the very start of her career as an entertainer. Mr. Coombs' aggressive and demanding approach to those who worked with made it impossible for anyone to challenge him. Miss Ventura soon learned that Mr. Coombs insisted on blind loyalty from everyone in his inner circle. Although Mr. Ven Although Ms. Ventura had saved up some earnings from her young modelling career, Mr. Coombs' ostentatious display of wealth was intimidating to her. Mr. Coombs paid for things with wads of cash and would repeatedly tell Miss Ventura, don't worry about money, I have money. Mr. Coombs expensed lavish vacations for, for him and Miss Ventura purchased a car for her, paid for her apartment and provided her with extensive amounts of desire clothes. And I bet when he got that apartment for her, he said, uh, by the way, your boyfriend, he can't stay here. When he gave her the car, oh, by the way, I don't want your boyfriend in this car. You know what I mean? Mr. Coombs expensed lavish vacation for, oh, for Christ's sake, my cat. First, the car for a provider of extensive amounts of designer clothing. Around 2008 or 2009, Mr. Coons began to rent an apartment in Manhattan for Miss Ventura. The apartment was within walking distance of Mr. Coombs' New York residence. First, showed Miss Ventura the apartment by bringing her there along with her parents. Miss Ventura's parents were skeptical of the mogul's display of wealth but proud of their daughter's newfound success. Around 2010, Mr. Coombs similarly paid for an, an apartment for Miss Ventura in Los Angeles. Hang on, that one's in Los Angeles, where's this one? That one's in Manhattan. So she had another apartment in Los Angeles, which was paid, well, okay, about five minutes away from Mr. Coombs. He paid for 
Many of her apartments in California also purchased a jack for her around 2013 or 2014. All aspects of Miss Ventura's life was controlled by either Mr. Coombs or his management companies. Every event Miss Ventura attended from travel to the makeup and clothing was paid for directly by Mr. Coombs and his affiliated companies. Compounding this all encompassing intrusion into her life, Mr. Coombs secured his control over the young impressionable Miss Ventura by introducing her to a drug fueled lifestyle that kept her complacent and compliant. Mr. Coombs first introduced Miss Ventura to opiates around 2008 and would often have pills and other DRUGS out in the open, like candy. Upon information and belief, Mr. Coombs had, had been addicted to prescription painkillers and took certain drugs frequently. At first, Miss Ventura was given the prescription, given the prescription that Mr. Coombs received from a doctor in Miami, Florida. Eventually, when Mr. Coombs exhausted his supply of pills, he demanded that Miss Ventura procure a prescription from his this Miami doctor in her own name. Mr. Coombs also became deeply involved in Miss Ventura's personal life with his personal staff attending to Miss Ventura's day-to-day travel needs, including medical care. On multiple occasions, Miss Ungdung, I'm going a bit quick, thingy. Leave my watch drop alone. Leave it alone. Leave. Right. Um, this cat I'm going to shoot. Mr. Coombs became, also became deeply involved in Miss Ventura's lifestyle with his personal staff attending to Miss Ventura's day-to-day traveling avenues including medical care. On multiple occasions, Mr. Coombs had Miss Ventura's personal medical records sent directly to his email address. Now that's wrong. No one, apart from another doctor, and only if you give them permission to see your medical records. You know what I mean? So why was they sending her medical records to him? There's so many people in this that are involved in this coercion and everything. So, so many people. Right. For instance, when Miss Ventura began experiencing memory loss, potentially due to, due to excessive drug use or head injuries caused by Mr. Coombs' beatings, as described below, uh, MR, MRI results were provided directly to Mr. Coombs. Mr. Coombs also repeatedly arranged for his staff to drive Miss Ventura to certain doctor appointments. In this way, Mr. Coombs exerted ownership over Miss Ventura. As another example of his way in which he manipulated Miss Ventura and ensured obedience early on in their relationship, he asked Miss Ventura what she called her grandfather. When Miss Ventura said she referred to her grandfather as Pop Pop, Mr. Coombs perversely insisted that Miss Ventura refer to him with that nickname. I was sick. She's got to refer to him using the name, the nickname, what she referred to her grandfather as Pop Pop. What did you call your grandfather? Shit face. That's what I just said. Shit face. He wouldn't want you to be calling him shit face then, would he? Mr. Coombs and Miss Ventura's relationship becomes violent and abusive. What started as a whirlwind of celebrity meetings and DRUG and alcohol fuel parties, however, quickly turned frightening and violent 
Miss Renshaw were also exposed to the intense violence that provided Mr. Coombs rise to fame. For example, on one occasion when Mr. Coombs and Miss Renshaw was using the IGS to give his own, one of his security staff barged in and announced that Sugnard, a long-time rival of Mr. Coombs, was spotted at Mal Drive in Di- Mal Drive Di- driving down in Los Angeles. Mr. B- Mr. Coombs began to get dressed, retrieved multiple GUNs from a safe and ran out of his house to where he believed Mr. Knight was dying. So he was out to kill. He was out to kill Mr. Knight that, at that time. Oh my lord. On at least two occasions, Mr. Coombs demanded that Miss Venture hold Mr. Coombs GUN in her purse. Miss Venture had no familiarity with guns and was petrified that the firearm would accidentally go off in her purse. There was no clear reason why Mr. Coombs required her to hold this GUN, except to reinforce to his young girlfriend that he was violent, powerful and dangerous. Over the next decade, multiple times each year, Mr. Coombs would violently beat Miss Ventura, leaving bruises on her body. After every instance in which he beat Miss Ventura, Mr. Coombs used his money and power to orchestrate extensive efforts to hide the evidence of his abuse, including by hiding Miss Ventura in hotels for days at a time to let her bru- bruises heal. In one such instance, after a fight with Jay Z, Mr. Coons beat Miss Ventura repeatedly in an escalade, in an escalade, including by kicking and hitting her. He forced her out of the vehicle on Fifth Avenue, New York, New York City. She was eventually able to hail a cab and get to her apartment in Manhattan, where she cried in fear, realizing there was no one she could tell about. What had happened at the hands of this incredible, powerful man? She spent the subsequent three days hiding in her apartment. In January 2009, Mr. Coombs learned that Miss Ventura spoke to another music manager, music manager at a party in Los Angeles. He became enraged. She had hoped speaking to, his man, to this manager would allow her to further grow her career and that Mr. Coombs would be happy for her. But instead, he became extremely angry and pulled her out of the club where the party was taking place. In the car leaving the club, Mr. Coons beat Miss Ventura, pushing her into the corner of the vehicle and jumping on her face. Mr. Coons' security staff, Roger Bonds, tried to stop the beating, but was unable to de-escalate the situation. When the car arrived at Mr. Coons' residence, Miss Ventura attempted to run away. Mr. Coons followed her and proceeded to again kick her in the face. Miss Venture was bleeding profusely and was ushered into Mr. Coons' home where she began to throw up from the violent assault. Upon recognising the damage she had done and the physical evidence of his blank, Mr. Coons panicked and forced his staff to bring Miss Venture to a hotel suite at the London Hotel in Los Angeles where she was required to stay for a week. During this time, as her injuries from the beating healed, Miss Ventura began to fully realise that Mr. Coombs' tremendously long network not only knew about and witnessed his assault, but also that these witnesses were not willing to do anything meaningful to stop Mr. Coombs' behaviour. She recognised that she was powerless and that reporting Mr. Coombs to the authorities would not alter Mr. Coombs' status or influence, but would merely give Mr. Coombs another excuse to hurt her. Hmm. Right, I'm going to show you this video. Um, just to give me a break from reading that for a minute or so. 
Ben that like I said, this is trigger warning. What you're likely to see and hear is triggering. If any time, any time during this live, which I might actually finish after shortly after this video because I don't want to go on too long and continue tomorrow night maybe on this. And if at any time you feel this is too much, you can't cope with it, that's fine. The video, the live will still be here. You can come back to it anytime you want. Don't feel you've got to sit and watch it in one go. You can't. It's too much. It's too much. Just walk away. Your health comes first. I implore that on anyone. If you're watching it on this on the if you're watching this on repeat um replay, please. If this is too much, just walk away. Just walk away. Your health comes first. Anyway, we're going to listen to this because I need to drink a bit of my coffee and try and get a bit of a break, okay? I don't know what this one is. But, but the reason oh, this is when they can leave right on this phone. Right, here's another video of the same attack, but it just shows a bit more. So I'm giving out a warning. Oh. Oh.
Oh man, I'm glad whoever got that footage got that footage, you know what I mean? So, just take that up there. But I'm glad they got that footage when they did. But what I can't stand. Well, I think, you know when she put this complaint in, and then she put the complaint in one day, and then the next day she settled, she, they gave her a payoff. I think her lawyer and his lawyer are probably said, look, if you take this to court, it's going to be your word against his. Who do you think they're going to believe? You know what I mean? Uh, a top musician and entrepreneur and whatever in his right or you just a a young upcoming entertainer and I think that's why she settled so quickly because I think they said you won't win if you take us to court take them to court you're not going to win I won't believe you. Right, let's go back to this. We'll carry on for a little bit longer. Right, while in the hotel, she asked to go home to her parents. But Mr. Coons wouldn't let her leave. She lied to her mother when asked about an online gossip forum that reported the assault. Mr. Coons proceeded to instruct his assistant to purchase excessive amounts of gifts from Miss Ventura, which were delivered to the hotel room where she remained trapped. Miss Ventura was terrified, isolated and unable to see a pathway out of Mr. Coombs' ab abusive hold on her life. She found herself becoming numb to the ABUSC she was experienced and became entirely beholden to Mr. Coombs' demands. She began to blindly follow his instructions out of fear of again. Being, end, being on the end, receiving end of a vicious beating. Mr. Coombs' own admission, his relationship with Miss Fenture was like Bobby and Whitney. A clear acknowledgement of the unequal power dynamic and excess, excessive dynamic violence that permitted their, permit, permit, permitted their relationship. From the outside looking in, Miss Ventura had heard others refer to their relationship with Mr. Coombs as, as to Ike and Tina. Yes. Yeah, because he was very nasty to Tina. You know what I mean? He was nasty. 
Her volatile and producer partner, who also owned a label and therefore held her future success in his hand, had fully exerted control over every aspect of her life. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever you do, if you want to get into the music business, find a good music manager. Find one that is uh, understanding to your needs. And don't fall in love with that person or don't feel that you've got to go along with that person because you can always leave. You can go elsewhere in a music business. Right? You can. Or just come out of the music business altogether. And do something else with your life. Ah. Within a few months of beginning a re romantic relationship with 40-year-old Mr. Coombs, a 22-old... 22-year-old Miss Ventura felt beholden to his whims and demands. So, he's like 18 years old now. Mm? While in New York City, Mr. Coombs told Miss Ventura that he wanted to engage in a fantasy of his called, of his called voyeurism. Mr. Coombs said it would turn him on if he saw Miss Ventura with another blank. The first time Mr. Coombs hired a man and brought the man to his home in Los Angeles, the man Mr. Coombs and Miss Ventura wore masquerade masks and ingested D-R-U-G-S. Mr. Coombs directed Miss Ventura to perform with this man while Mr. Coombs watched them. He pleasured himself, I will say, while he directed Miss Ventura and the man to do specific blank. The entire encounter lasted multiple days, for sake. Mr. Coons began to call the arrangement a freak off or FO. I know what FO stands in my language and it's not freak off. He would repeatedly tell Miss Ventura at random moments that he wanted an FO, and Miss Ventura was eventually expected to facilitate the location and the hiring of male sex workers. At certain points during Miss Ventura and Mr. Coon's relationship, he would insist on an FO weekly. Well, yeah, I wouldn't want to do more than one, one a week. Mr. Coons would repeatedly tell Miss Ventura that this practice was our thing and our secret. Right? Yeah, well, how did it go from just you and Cassie, right, to then renting, like, two floors of a hotel, two top floors of a hotel, maybe, to where you were then getting all your other people on your payroll and other celebrities involved in these FOs. Hmm? Now I've been hearing that apparently Jay-Z, don't know how true it is, is worse than Coombs, did he? Worse than did he? But apparently, Jay Z has got more sense. Jay Z keeps it private. Right? Now, what two consenting adults do in their own time is their business. I have no care in the world if they are consenting. If one is not consenting, then there's a problem. You know what I mean? But if they're both consenting adults, then do what you want. I don't really care. 
right? And I think that's how Jay Z does it. He does it privately. Yeah, he doesn't make a big thing of it. Where it's publicly known by all the celebrities. Right, FOs would often take place in hotel suites, include at the Trump International Hotel in Columbus Circle, Lermitage Beverly Hills, the London Hotel in Los Angeles, the Inter Intercontinental Century City, the Intercontinental Atlanta, the Intercontinental New York City, the One Hotel in New York and in Miami, the Mandarin Hotel, Oriental Hotel in New York and in Miami, the Fontainebleau Blower in Miami, the Beverly Hills Hotel, the Shutters on the Beach in Los Angeles. Well, by saying, bringing out all the names of these hotels, right, is either going to think, put think, you know what, we're not going to stay at that hotel no more. Or, we're gonna, you're going to have a lot of people wanting to stay at that hotel because, oh my God, Coombs and Cassie, they used to do their freak-offs here. Sick. You're going to get those sick individuals who want to stay at the hotel for that reason. Right. On one occasion around 2013, Mr. Coombs had a FO set up at an inter intercontinental hotel in New York City after which he was charged with tens of thousands of dollars in damages by the hotel. Tens of thousands. What the hell? What did they damage? The beds? Cupboards? Wardrobes? Windows? Mirrors? Lamps? Upon information and belief, Mr. Coombs' chief of staff, Tony Fletcher, paid the invoice charged by the hotel. Miss Venture was, was eventually instructed to use websites and escort services to find male sex workers to participate in the FOs. Mr. Coombs told Miss Venture to search for large black whatever on the website. Sometimes Mr. Coombs would pay to fly male sex workers to it. That's where they're getting the, um, the trafficking in, where they're bringing them in from other states. including to multiple cities in the United States as well as abroad. He required Miss Ventura and his staff to help him make these arrangements. Mr Coombs' assistant would help, set, help to set up the FOs, including by setting up the hotel suites with Baby Oil and Astroglide. Remind me never to buy Baby Oil. I cannot... I, I don't think I could even go into a pharmacist and look at baby oil or anything like that again without thinking of this piece of shit. I really couldn't. All right. Come on, could you all, could you imagine going up and picking up baby No, no, no. I cannot even pick up a bottle of baby oil no more. I'm not going there. Please, anyone who knows me, do not. Who's who watches anyone who watches my videos and knows me, do not send me baby oil or anything like that because it's going straight in their bin. Oh, I'm getting all the shivers here just thinking about that. Right? Mr. Coombs' assistant, right? We've gone past that bit. Mr. Coombs always supplied Miss Ventura and the sex workers, worker, with copious amount of DIUG before, before pardon me, and join the FOs. Miss Ventura was giving, I'm not reading them, drug DRUGS, in excessive, and alcohol in excessive amounts during FOs. 
which allowed her to disassociate during these horrific encounters. It became commonplace to get IV fluids in the days after an FO to recover from the excessive substance pushed upon her. As I said last night when we was reading the other one, right, I want to know who was doing the IVs. Who was putting these IVs in? Because you've got to know what you're doing when you put an IV in. I couldn't just do an IV. You've got to know what you're doing. You know what I mean? So was there a doctor involved who would come in and do these IVs? Uh, right. Miss Ventura was required to dress up in lingerie for an FO and Mr Coombs insisted she wear white nail polish con to contrast her nails with the skin of the black men he hired to have sex with her. No, I'd have on my fingernails. F-U-C-K on one and Y-O-U on the other hand. So I'll give it and show. During the FO, Mr. Coons was going to Miss Ventura to put excessive amounts of oil over herself. Really? Mr. Coons would then instruct Miss Ventura and the sex workers to speak to each other and then would specifically tell Miss Ventura where to touch the sex workers. Mr. Coons would say things like, grab that big black and ask her, how does it feel, as he directed her to perform for him. During the FOs, in addition to directing Miss Ventura and pleasuring himself, Mr Coons would use his phone, laptop and tablet to film Miss Ventura having sex with the hired sex worker. He treated the first encounter as a personal art project, adjusting the candles he used for lighting to frame the videos he took. While Miss Ventura quickly deleted any photographs or videos of such acts, if they were on her phone, Mr Coons repeatedly made clear that he retained many videos of Miss Ventura during the FO. Even when she deleted the videos, Mr Coons would tell Ventura that he was able to recover deleted videos from her device. On one occasion, he sat next to her on a flight and made her watch a video thought she had deleted, reinforcing her ability to escape and immerse the power he held over her. Hmm. Mr. Coons paid the male sex workers a few thousand dollars in cash for their services. A few thousand. Hmm. During some efforts, Mr. Coons would become extremely intoxicated and would get Miss Ventura in front of the male sex workers. Miss Ventura was repulsed by Mr. Coons' demands, but between the physical beating and recognising his incredible power and incredible temper, Miss Ventura became petrified of her partner and boss and felt that she could not say no. He would even present her with lavish gifts prior or to or in the middle of efforts seemingly acknowledging the way in which these forced sexual encounters constituted work for Miss Ventura and that he needed to compensate her for this work. At one point he had given her so many design braces for FOs and immediately following his brutal beating that she felt that she was shackled by his presence. Frequently, her anxiety from falling off would become so great that she would become physically ill, sometimes to the point of vomiting. While kneeling over the toilet, Mr. Coons would shame her into performing for him, eventually forcing her to get up and proceed with the encounter. She knew first hand that telling Mr. Coons that she did not want to engage in affairs was met with anger and violence. In addition, any suggestion that Miss Ventura refused the FOs or otherwise report Mr. Coombs' abuse we've met, was met with ultimatums by Mr. Coombs, who would say that Miss Ventura could not go to the police because she had a lot to lose. Yeah, 
เคเวียร์ Around August 2015, for example, in the middle of a surprise birth, this is what got me when I was reading this. Around August 2015, for example, in the middle of a surprise birthday dinner for Miss Ventures when she was 29th birthday. She's 29 now, so this has been going on for 10 years. She was 19 when she met him. Mr. Coombs has insisted that Miss Ventura leave the party and go to a hotel for an FO. When she expressed that she did not want to go, Mr. Coombs had Miss Ventura recalling a body security staff in order to force her to leave with him. After this FO, Mr. Coombs and Miss Ventura went back to the hotel, hotel room that Miss Ventura was staying in, where some of her of Miss Ventura's friends were already hanging out. Mr. Coombs was severely intoxicated and at one point, listen to this, John and I picked up one of Miss Ventura's friends friends like a child and dangled their friend over the balcony of the 17th floor hotel suite. What the heck? And no one, no one in that room reported this. No one. Miss Ventura and her friends were scared of Miss Cocoon's erratic behaviour, but Miss Ventura was heavily sedated because of the drugs she took to participate in the FO, and therefore was unable to respond to Miss Cocoon's terrifying behaviour. The FO became work for Miss Ventura, and despite a protest, protest, protestations, rather, Mr. Coombs insisted on this intricately staged and forced sexual encounters between Miss Ventura and various male sex workers. Any time she tried to create distance between her and Mr. Coombs, he used his network to find her and convince her to return to his ABUSC. On multiple occasions, Mr. Coombs sent employees to lure Miss Ventura back. In 2011, during a rough patch in Mr. Coombs and Miss Ventura's relationship, Miss Ventura had a brief relationship with a musician, Kid Coody. Right? When Mr. Coombs returned from a trip, he demanded getting a FO of, of, of Miss Ventura. She acquiesced, I, I can't say that word. During this effort, Mr. Coons found Miss Ventura's found and found emails between her and Kid Coody. Mr. Coons became enraged and proceeded to place a manual corkscrew between his fingers and lunged at Miss Ventura. Miss Ventura ran away to start Kid Coody's house to ex home to escape Mr. Coons' wrath. Soon thereafter, one of Mr. Coons' staff members told Miss Ventura that he needed or she needed to just talk to Mr. Coombs, even though Mr. Coombs was enraged. Feeling like she could not escape Mr. Coombs and his network of enforcers, Miss Ventura returned to Mr. Coombs. He hit her several times and kicked her in the back as she tried to run out the door. She went to her parents' home in Connecticut where her mother took pictures of the bruises Mr. Coombs had left on Miss Ventura's body. In February 2012, during Paris Fashion Week, Mr. Coombs told Ven Miss Ventura that he was going to blow up Kid Coody's car and that he wanted to ensure that Kid Coody was home with his friends when it happened. Around that time, Kid Coody's car exploded in his driveway. Miss Ventura was terrified as she began to fully comprehend what Mr. Coombs was both willing and able to do to those he believed had slighted him. In 2015, Miss Ventura spoke to a popular music manager after an after party in a hotel suite in Las Vegas. Mr. Coombs saw her speaking to this manager and sternly told her to step into the bedroom adjoining the suite. In the bedroom, Mr. Coombs beat Miss Ventura severely. She ran from corner to corner of the room trying to avoid Mr. Coombs beating and kicking. When she tried to lock herself in the bathroom, he pushed through and punched and kicked her while she curled up under the toilet. Her screams were drowned out by the loud music playing in the outside area 
the hotel suite. When Mr. Coon's head of security and assistant saw Miss Ventura after the assault, they began to cry. Miss Ventura had two black eyes, a burst and bruised lip, and a huge welt on her forehead. Upon seeing the result of this vicious attack, Mr. Coons immediately took steps to conceal his wrongdoing. He forced Miss Ventura to stay at his home in Hornby Hill, along with one of his sons. While there, Mr. Coons FaceTimed Miss Ventura and stated, You've got to go out, get up and put more makeup on. My son can't see you like that. Well, you shouldn't have done it then, should you? She did put makeup on, but Mr. Coombs demands, per Mr. Coombs demand, Miss Ventura felt that she had no choice but to obey her abuser. Even though security guards, assistants and friends saw the situation she was in, no one dared to help her or speak up on her behalf. She therefore had no choice but to remain subservient. Late in 2015, while shooting a movie in Cape Town, South Africa, Miss Ventura began a flirtatious relationship with her an actor. Didn't know she's uh, an actress. Spent New Year's Eve with this actor. But Coombs soon found out. Mr Coombs called the actor and threatened him. The actor proceeded to call Miss Ventura and tell her you really need to call Mr Coombs. In or around March 2016, during an at the Intercontinental Hotel in Century City, Los Angeles, Mr. Coons became extremely intoxicated and punched Miss Ventura in the face, giving her a black eye. After he fell asleep, Miss Ventura tried to leave the hotel, but as she ex exited, Mr. Coons woke, awoke and began screaming at Miss Ventura. He followed her into the hallway of the hotel while yelling at her. He grabbed at her and took, then took far, glass vases in the hallway and threw them at her, causing glass to crash around them as she ran to the elevator to escape. She managed to get to the elevator when, and when she got to the lobby, quickly took a cab to her apartment. Pam realising that her running away. Now that was that incident we just seen in that video. That was that incident. Right, upon realising that, her running away would cause Mr. Coons to be even angrier with her and completely stuck in this vicious cycle of abuse, Miss Ventura returned to the hotel with the intention of apologising for running away from her abuser. When she returned, hotel security staff urged her to get back into a cab and go to her apartment, suggesting that they had seen the security footage showing Mr. Coons beating Miss Ventura and throwing glass at her in the hall, hotel hallway. Upon information and belief, Mr. Coons paid Intercontinental Century City $50,000 for the hallway security footage from that evening. <sighs> they may have gave it him, but someone kept a recording of it, a copy of it. I bet he felt sick to his stomach when that video came out. After this, Miss Ventura left her home in Comstock and went to hide away at a friend's home in Florida. James Cruz, president of Bad Boys Management, tracked Miss Ventura down and told her that her single would not be released if she did not answer Mr. Coombe's phone call. I said, I said, we should my single, I don't want it. You know what I mean? A woman who worked at Sony Music reached out to her with a similar ultimatum concerning her record. Really, I would have just said, you know what, go fuck yourself because I don't care what you do that single. Release it, don't release it, I don't care. You know what I mean? I've had enough. I can't do this no more. Incredibly, Mr. Convince even convinced one of his attorneys to call Miss Ventura at this time. This lawyer told Miss Ventura that it's in your best interest to call Mr. Coombs back. Each time Miss Ventura tried to run away from Mr. Coombs and his powerful network, 
Mr. Coombs. His powerful network would force her back to him. Mr. Coombs' tight hold over her life and had irreparable damage her friendships. Around 2018, when Ms. was with her friend Kerry Morgan in her house, Mr. Coombs used his key in Ms. Venture's house and came in on the nose. He and Ms. Morgan had an altercation during which Mr. Coombs threw a hanger at Ms. Morgan. Upon information and belief, the incident resulted in a settlement between Mr. Coombs and Ms. Morgan, and Ms. Ventura ended up paying Ms. Morgan additional funds in an attempt to resolve the dispute. Well, that's a friend for you, isn't it? Eh, uh, Cassie? That was a good friend. Well, she was making you pay money as well. Well, the relationship between Miss Venture and Miss Morgan had been strained since this time. Uh, well, I'd say no friendship. He he came in unannounced. He's the one who did the attacking, not me. And yet you are not only claiming money off him, you're claiming compensation off me. So we have no friendship. If we had a friendship, you'd be sticking up for me. You know what I mean? Seeing the extreme measures Mr. Coombs took, a, took to keep a tight hold on Miss Ventura and isolated from the support network and having experienced the repercussions of rejecting his demands, Miss Ventura felt that saying no to Mr. Coombs would cost her something, her family, her friends, her career or even her life. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just sad that even a friend, when, you know what I mean? Uh, if that was me, right, and my friend's partner coming unannounced, right, let himself into the, her house or whatever, and then it started an argument and he threw a coat hanger at me, Right, I wouldn't then go, not only just press for damages off him, and I, I wouldn't be pressing damages off her. I'd be saying to her, right, well, we're going down to the whoever. We're going to make this public. He cannot come near you no more. You know what I mean? You need, we need, you need to put a stand here now. Right? Even if it means leaving your home, your car, everything. Leave it all behind. But for her friend then to want compensation of her, no wonder their relationship was strained. That isn't a friend who's going to turn against you in a time of need. That was the only one attack her friend had. She has attacked. She's been attacked and assaulted like that daily. Daily. You know what I mean? I'm going to leave it there. We're on page 24 of 35. So we've got another 11 pages, and my throat's getting a bit hot. So I'm going to leave it there. Leave me a comment again um, in the, on there. If you're on X, you probably noticed I have put up on my page the unedited for, um, document that we went through last night. Put up the unedited. I've also put two other documents up. Right, that I've just come across today. So I put them up as well on my X account. Go and read them. I've, they're unedited. I can do that on X, but I can't do it on YouTube. I have to edit a lot out. Which is a bit annoying. I wish, um, what's his name, would take over YouTube, by YouTube out. Perhaps then he'd become a bit more relaxed with the rules. And we wouldn't have to use these pew pew and sh white powder and st stupid words, you know what I mean? 
So it just annoys me when we have we can't say these words. Because if we do, well, I'm okay at the moment because I'm not monetized. But when I become monetized, I have to be a lot more careful in what I say. Right? Because um, they will re restrict the monetization. They, they literally stop my monetization for that video. Which means any adverts that are shown, right, during that video, not my live, but the video ones that I put up on YouTube, I will not get any revenues from because I get lost all monetization for that video just for saying certain words. So I wish Elon Musk, Elon Musk, do us a favor, buy YouTube out. Because on X, we can put these videos out and we can. If I was just to stream directly to X and not YouTube, I'd be fine. I'd be able to say these words without going blank, 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 blank. Or pew, pew. Or white powder. Or sugar. And things like that. You know what I mean? So... I could stream directly to, but then I can't put it on YouTube. I can't upload it onto YouTube. I could, could stream directly to just X and not YouTube. And then after I've uploaded, well, downloaded it onto my laptop. Because when you finish this recording, you have to download it onto your laptop or computer. Then you have to upload it onto YouTube. Well, if I didn't edit out all these words, I wouldn't be able to upload it onto YouTube. So, either way, it's stupid. I know I've had people come on and say, look, you don't have to, you don't have to watch what you're saying on X. Yes, but you don't realise this is not just going on X. This is going on YouTube. And I also put some of my videos on my Facebook page. So I have to be careful what I put on my videos there. Right? I don't put many of my YouTube, my videos on my Facebook page no more. I don't put these ones on there. Anything where it's got a lot of explicit words that we're not allowed to say I will not put on Facebook because Facebook blocked me once not long ago for breaking their community rules and I'm thinking what did I post what did I post I only post I was only posting things about missing children at the time nothing sexual nothing about pew pews or d-r-u-g-s nothing like that and yet, apparently I broke at Facebook community rules. So I had to open, eventually, when they would let me, I opened up a new Facebook account. So I'm being very careful what I post on my Facebook account. Because my Facebook account is not just for this, for my YouTube account. It's also my, I've got my personal Facebook account, which is for family members only family members well a few family members like my son my daughter and their partners and their parents and my f some friends in Dundee where I live and my sister and my nephew and my niece down in Birmingham and a few friends down in Birmingham and that is it that is all I have on my one account so but on my other account, I have a lot of crime, uh, true crime people. So I'll just have to watch what they post. And if I see anything going against with certain things in it, I'm going to just have to block that post from going on my page. Anyway. I'd just like to say thank you for those for being here with me tonight. 
as I said, I will be posting these documents unedited version on my X account. The edited version will go on my Facebook account and my YouTube account. But the unedited will go onto my X account. Oh, and Discord. Unedited on my Discord account as well. The link for my Discord will be in... I think I've got... I'm not sure if they're unedited or edited. But I know I have got some documents on my Discord account. So, I'll put the link to my Discord account in the description if anyone's interested in that. Because from now on, that is going to be where I'll post a lot of these videos on there. And on my ex and on YouTube, but not so much on Facebook. I'll only post videos about missing children on my Facebook account. Because I'm not using any words that I shouldn't be using. Even though I'd like to use a few choice words for some people. Right? I don't. So, anyway, thank you for being here with me tonight. And I will see you all. Take this off. I will see you all. What day is it tomorrow? Wednesday? Yes, I'll see you all tomorrow. We'll continue with this. One, and we're on, what page are we on? 24. Okay. So we'll continue with this tomorrow night. Finish this one off tomorrow. And then we're going to look at um, that other one. Well, I've got the video as well for that. Okay. But we'll look at her statement. There's so many statements. It, indictments it's unbelievable as you've just seen the list of all those indictments and then i'm probably be on thursday but i'm not sure what time because i've got to go to my son's house and look after my granddaughter so it all depends what time my daughter-in-law and grandson get home thursday as to what time i get home i'll probably get a taxi home Right, so it may be about 9, it may be about 10 p.m. But if I do come on that late, then it'll only be a short hourly video live. It won't be a long one. Okay, so I'll be back again, same place, same time, tomorrow. So until then. When you should be getting after it. I got facts over facts over tracks, this and that, spitting slow, spitting fast, I could roast, I could gas, think I'm okay at last, but I don't know if that can erase all the past, and the pettiness, oh reflection of the emptiness, hilarious, you think you're worth my time, you're delirious, mysterious, because you are behind a fake exterior, inferior, you know I'll always be a bit superior, get off of me, this ain't no humble brag, I want you to hear words, you can say them back, I want you to feel free from the chains at last, and to believe in what you got, it was built to last, yeah. Now that I've been put through, I never got anyone's help, I had to do it all myself. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take, I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up and make a statement. I don't ever slow up, no I don't take, I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up and make a statement. Of being incompetent, mental health is confidence, dreams and some honestness. I'm not here to save the day, that's for you to take away. I could play a million mind games, but instead of say something not illogical, something that is topical, rub it on and watch it go. Make yourself unstoppable, dreams are irresponsible, but they're always possible. If you just believe, you could be so remarkable. Thoughts in my head, a collage, and they spread. I'll be great one day, going off of my neck. Thank you.